There we go. And then I will introduce Gail. Um, so Gail Latmore is a veteran of nonprofit management and development with over 30 years experience working in the public or nonprofit sector. She has served as the executive director of Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corp um, since 1998. In this role, she has overall responsibility for management, growth, and health of one of Boston's largest community development corporations. During Gail's tenure, the NDC has grown significantly, expanding its service base to meet the needs of the community. Additionally, during this time, the NDC has developed over 500 units of affordable housing, both home ownership and rental. Gail holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from Columbia University and has completed coursework toward a master's degree in urban affairs at Boston University. A founding board member of the Deadly Street Neighborhood Initiative, Gail continues to serve on several state, regional and local boards dedicated to responsible community development, including the Massachusetts Association of Community Development Corporations and the Four Corners Action Coalition. Um, we are so excited to have Gail with us today. And with that, I will turn the time over to her. Thank you, Miranda. And thanks for the invitation to come and speak about our Fairmount commuter rail line work and our housing and transit oriented development work related to that. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really sorry that we can't see each other. I thought that it was gonna be a small intimate group and I was looking forward to seeing that small intimate group on the, um, on the screen, but I can't see anyone because we're in webinar uh, format. So uh, I'm gonna to talk today about some of the work that we've done uh, in the Fairmount Commuter Rail Line, uh, Fairmount Community Development Collaborative. Um, which is a collaborative that is composed of uh, three community development corporations, um, Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, which is the agency that I uh, manage, as well as Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation. Um, all of us located in Boston, various neighborhoods of Boston, and Southwest Boston Community Development Corporation, which operates out of uh, neighborhoods called Hyde Park and Roslindale. We've been working together for the last, oh, I think it's now approaching, if not over 20 years, as a collective of community development corporations all focused on a range of issues, but most particularly housing development. When I spoke with Lorraine uh, Dixon-Jones about doing this um, presentation, I had done the same presentation actually that, um, for um, the uh, EPA uh, back in the fall. Um, and I had done it in conjunction with a couple of other people who were speaking to some of the economic development and other components. Um, Lorraine had wanted me to focus more on the housing side of what we do, but um, I, I went ahead and kept the, the presentation very broad, but certainly can try to speak as much as possible to the housing side of what we do. There, there are some elements of the housing side in my presentation. Happy to take any questions. I want to just give a heads up that while I've been the executive director since 1998, I am more of a general practitioner. We hire the um, real estate staff and I rely heavily on our real estate director. And I know this is a housing group. It's not that I don't understand housing, but if there's a lot of details um, about the, what I'm going to talk about from the housing side, I'd be happy to try to do uh, answer questions, but also connect people and follow up with folks on any you know, kind of detailed nitty gritty questions. So with that, I'm going to share my uh, screen and go into the presentation. This has many slides, so I'm gonna to try to go fast, um, but please, uh, because I don't wanna to spend too much time on my presentation, I was told about 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes on the presentation. This could easily take that long, but feel free. I'm gonna go fast because I wanna be able to have more of a conversation. Again, I'm sorry that we can't see each other in a different format because it's a small intimate group. But so the Fairmount Community Development Collaborative, as I said, uh, it's uh, three community development corporations that have been doing work together um, for almost 20 years, all along the Fairmount commuter rail line. And this is a commuter rail line that um, is in our neighborhood that goes straight through our neighborhoods. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the goal of our collaborative is to basically strengthen the uh, communities that are linked by the Fairmount commuter rail line as places of opportunity, places where people want to uh, call home and, and with a particular emphasis on low and moderate income people. Altogether, we have about 
Uh, we are, we are, Dorchester is one of the largest neighborhoods of Boston and it's an inner city neighborhood of Boston and the other neighborhoods of um, Hyde Park, also predominantly low mod income community of color with mostly Afro-Americans and Afro-Caribbeans as well as a significant Latino base. Um, but that's, that's the geography and we have about, I wanna say Boston has about close to 600,000 people and we literally have about 200,000 of those people living in our collective service areas, the three community development corporations. So it's a significant number of folks and it's, you know, to us, it's kind of from a Boston perspective, regional in nature because of the scope of how many people are in our service area and about 90,000 of those folks live within walking distance, which is a half mile radius of this of the stops on the Fairmount commuter rail line that we're we're, we're targeting. So our core agendas for the uh, the three community development corporations in the Fairmount CDC collaborative uh, is to further transit equity. And we've been able to achieve um, that. Uh, we've got four new stops on the line uh, and, a, and $200 million in state funding that we were able to advocate and, and win with a lot of community activism to install those stops since, since 2012. Um, and the last stop was installed in 2019, just a couple of years ago. We also are um, very focused on uh, uh, transit-oriented development of affordable housing. We really wanted to acquire as much land and properties within a half mile radius of each of the existing stops on the Fairmount line and the proposed stops, then proposed stops 20 years ago, so that we could um, you know, develop them uh, as affordable housing. and. Um, and prevent displacement as a result of that, because we know that transit is one of the leading factors in gentrification and displacement, which by the way is happening in our neighborhood uh, very much so. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the um, affordable housing, TOD housing work that we've been about. One of our other initial goals, the top three that, I see, that you see here on the screen were our initial goals when we first launched. So the Greenway was another issue for us, another key goal for us. And that was our effort to create along this nine mile commuter rail line, the Fairmount commuter rail line, kind of a green corridor, you know, connecting our neighborhoods together through passive recreational spaces, bike paths, uh, parks, et cetera. And there's been some significant work done there. And then more recently, over the last 10 years, we've been focused even more on economic opportunity, good jobs and financial resilience issues. And then just within the last two or so years, the Fairmount CDCs have um, been very focused on sustainability issues, particularly climate justice issues um, in our inner city neighborhoods. So the Fairmount commuter rail line is a nine mile commuter rail line that uh, it starts in downtown Boston in the South Station area, which is a major hub downtown. And um, approximately 35 to 40% of all the, the constituents that live in our inner city neighborhoods, the three CDC's inner city neighborhoods work downtown. So Fairmount commuter rail line is a kind of a economic umbilical, umbilical cord to those folks access to their jobs downtown. But what was happening before um, we advocated and got uh, the $200 million from the state to install the additional stops on the line is that this line did not stop in our neighborhood. And, our, and my neighborhood is based Dorchester, basically this geography that I'm, whoops, sorry, that I'm highlighting right now with my uh, cursor. It's in this, this general area. And then uh, Mattapan is a, was a, an original neighborhood that was also part of the collaborative and Roxbury and, and Upper Dor uh, North Dorchester was also a part. So the three CDC service area goes from about here all the way down to here, Hyde Park. And um, so the line would go through our communities without stopping. There literally were, was only one stop in Dorchester on the line. Um, and that stop was not well utilized. The Mass Bay Transit Authority's own study back in 2000, back in 2000 said that it was uh, utilized um, very, you know, not well utilized. Many people didn't even know who lived literally right near the stop, didn't know that it was a stop that could take them downtown. They thought it was a commuter rail, uh, a freight line. Um, that's how uh, underutilized it was. And there were no other stops until you got to the very, uh, end of the line, which is the high park area that I'm highlighting here. And that's a more suburban, more upper 
or more middle class neighborhoods of Boston uh, that I'm circling here and everything in between, which is the inner city neighborhoods was had no stops and was under resourced. And so folks, so this whole line really didn't exist for all intents and purposes until we advocated and got the resources. And that meant that people who lived in this middle section would have to take almost an hour or so to get downtown to their jobs. So this line, uh, once it was installed, once it got installed, allowed folks to get downtown in 15 minutes. So it was an economic umbilical cord for our neighborhood. And our neighborhood has about 93,000 people who live within half mile radius of the line. Um, these are some of the statistics of the neighborhood, a very much an inner city neighborhood, mostly Afro-Latino. Um, high. These statistics are from about 2017 or so, um, but these statistics still, it's still are in play in terms of high rates of unemployment, um, and particularly as the pandemic has impacted our community and um, you know, median incomes much less below the area median incomes. And so, so over the years, we have um, developed um, transit oriented development, transit oriented housing for about 4,000 residents. That means that the three, collectively, the three community development corporations in the Fairmount CDC Collaborative have developed about 1,000 units of housing over the last 20 years. And I know for some of you around the country, that's not a lot um, because some folks are developing five, 600 units a year easily. At a time, I know I belong to uh, the Neighbor Works Network of um, community development corporations across the country. And I know some of my peers are much more building many more units than that. But for the Boston area, that's a significant number of units um, given uh, the, the high cost of doing development and the high cost of acquiring sites in our neighborhood. But so over $400 million in public and private investments have been poured into this work. We've engaged over 3,000 residents, and this was 17 years, but I think it's closer now. I think this is a little old, this presentation, closer to about 20 years of our work. I think within the next year, we'll be approaching 20 years of the three community development corporations um, working together to do this work. We've engaged residents around advocacy issues. You'll see that to get the line, the money, to have the stops installed in our neighborhood. And we've been pushing now for more ridership and the ridership is going up. Uh, the pandemic did impact the ridership, but it's starting to, to get back to uh, high levels. Here's some of the impact that we've had um, as a collective and a collaborative, um, at least on the CDCs, the impact on the community has been tremendous, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, you know, we've been able to have a, a larger context for our efforts. We've been able to, because of our collective work, you know, get, uh, gain increased visibility and increased political cl uh, clout and power um, because we're not only bringing the three community development corporations together, two of which are very strong, um, well-known, uh, experienced community development corporations, um, but, but other organizations. We've been able to build many more kind of spin-off coalitions and collaborations, one that has to do with the uh, transit side. We have a transit coalition that is spun off of this work. Um, so it's just many more people involved in um, you know, the organizing and the advocacy as well as the um, strategic thinking. And we've been able to garner quite a bit of national and state attention to this. We were named um, by the White House um, you know, uh, back about say, eight or nine years ago um, uh, uh, for the work that we did. There's a video that, that was done. And here's some of our partners many, many partners that we've been involved in, both at the local level, as well as, um, you know, funders, uh, national as well as local funders, just to give you a sense. So on the transit equity side, and if there are any questions, let me know, but I'll just keep going otherwise. Um, this is the rail line, as I mentioned, and we were able to organize uh, constituents to fight to get $200 million in state funding. And we got four new stops opened up, two stops on the Fairmount line, on the two stops in our neighborhood. And by the way, the line has been in existence since the um, mid to, to late 1800s. And there actually were many stops in our neighborhood up until the line um, stopped running through our community. I think it was in the 1970s. So while we got four new stops installed with the $200 million, 
um, there actually were more like 11 or 12 um, stops on this line um, prior to the 1970s. And uh, that just happened to coincide with the community transitioning from a mostly white community to a mostly people of color neighborhood. Those stops got pulled out. So we are actually reopening stops in locations where the old stops used to be. And we also on the transit equity side have fought for fares, fair fares. So we got the fares down from $650 uh, one way, six uses six dollars and fifty cents one way to uh, subway level fares. And we've uh, pushed an increased ridership on the line. We now have we've also pushed for increased headways on the line so that we could get this line eventually operating like a rapid transit line, not a commuter rail line. So we just um, today, as a matter of fact, we're having right now a ceremony with state officials around right down the street announcing at one of the stops uh, increased headways for the stop. So this is some of the transit equity work that we've done. On the affordable housing side, we have, as I said, built about a thousand units of affordable housing, which has served about 4,000 low and moderate income people. This is, they're all within walking distance to the station. We've had an increasing focus on you know, building these units to the highest level of uh, energy uh, efficiency and sustainability. This building here is a 24 unit development that got uh, completed and we did the ribbon cutting with the then governor, Governor Patrick uh, of the state back in 2011 on the same day that right across the street, we cut the ribbon with the governor and other state officials for the uh, ground, the groundbreaking for the new stop, which uh, on the Fairmont line, which is right across the street from this, from this property. And Cobb Square in DC has at least 150 additional units of transit oriented development housing uh, within half mile walking distance of the two stops in our service area to, to be developed um, over the next two to three years. This is just an example of some of the housing that we've developed uh, this one got completed actually in 2017 or 18. Uh, it was under construction at the time, and it's again uh, within walking distance of the of the line. Uh, and it's a um, 44 unit rental development uh, that we did with using tax credits and combined it with a historic school site that we renovated. This is one of the developments that literally um, broke. Uh, excuse me, uh, had a ribbon cutting. It was completed last year, um, 88 units. Uh, it was completed by the Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation, which covers more um, upper Dor uh, North Dorchester. And this is the residence at Fairmount, which got completed about three and a half or so years ago. Um, it was one of the first affordable housing developments in the High Park neighborhood. That's the area to the south of the, the very end of the Fairmount commuter rail line um, that where that is a little more upper income, although a growing number of, of low and moderate income people moving in, but it's the first affordable housing development in 20 years on, in that neighborhood. And uh, we, Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corp worked with Southwest Boston CDC, which is one of our, who is one of our partners in the Fairmount CDC Collaborative um, to develop this site. Um, we, we helped them launch it and did, you know, we're the first joint venture partner in this because they were a small and still are a small, relatively young, they're about 20 years old, um, CDC approaching 20 years old. And at the time they were trying to launch this development, uh, they just didn't have the staff capacity. So our real estate project manager, um, you know, yoked them and basically got this project off the ground. And then it got turned over to a for-profit to complete the development after we launched it. So they now, this Community Development Corporation has now, um, as a result of just being stabilized with and getting this property up and running, was able to, is now uh, at about 75 units or so of housing because of this property getting them off the ground. And we knew though that when we were doing this work uh, back in the 2003, 2004, when we launched this work that um, you know, transit is one of the leading causes and indicators rather of gentrification and displacement. So we were certainly concerned about that as we started to uh, advocate for additional transit in our neighborhoods. And so we have launched a number of, you know, community-based campaigns uh, to kind of help maintain affordability in the neighborhood. Um, you know, we've uh, 
you know, try to get legislation passed to kind of have uh, renter rights and, and people able to stay in their communities. And sure enough, we, we definitely have started seeing, particularly in the last eight or so years, seven, eight years, a steady kind of trend of um, other upper income folks moving into the neighborhood. Uh, great diversity of folks moving into the neighborhood, but unfortunately, it's they're definitely causing pressure on housing prices. And so we've launched different campaigns. Uh, we did not win the Just Cause Eviction campaign, but we have been able to win the Community Preservation Act, which has increased slightly increased uh, the real estate taxes and all of, all of that money gets uh, split. I think it's raising uh, several hundred, uh, I don't know exactly how much, but millions of dollars a year. Uh, half of it gets split to for affordable housing um, projects and the other half goes into historic and open space projects. We are still working on the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, but again, just mobilizing residents to be involved and push for affordability is what we've been key on. On the economic opportunity side, we started um, doing more work on jobs and financial resilience in, in the corridor. So we started a job referral network where we place a number of folks into jobs. We now, Codman now has a green infrastructure training and certification program, which is a national certifi certification program that um, you know, prepares people to take on jobs, say in the green roof industry, or you know, trains folks on how to install green roofs, trains folks on you know, how to build green infrastructure. And so we continue to do a lot of that type of work to stimulate economic mobility in our community. And this um, Bornstein and Pearl uh, Food Production Center is a very impressive uh, uh, kind of micro kitchen or kitchen uh, cooperative kitchen that Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corp, one of the CDC partners launched, uh, literally now have uh, 31 businesses in a former hot dog factory that um, was abandoned that now this building over the last 10 or so years has been renovated. Uh, I think it's about 50 or so thousand square feet. 31 kind of businesses being yoked in that space, many jobs um, and, you know, all food oriented businesses being coming out of there. We've done a lot of work also on uh, in the economic development front in terms of resident financial capacity building, um, financial literacy, foreclosure prevention, some of the stats there. And then on the Greenway side, we have, um, you know, really worked hard to acquire sites for passive recreational and green activities along the Fairmount commuter, commuter rail line. This uh, photo here in the middle on the bottom is a picture of Codman Square's 23,000 square foot uh, urban agriculture site. This was literally the first year that we started cultivation of the site. So that was about seven years ago. It's a relatively old picture, but we now have the entire site activated. Um, now have a, a, a um, uh, it's a uh, refrigerator, walk-in refrigerator on site to help store the produce. And we um, distribute the produce about 6,000 pounds annually for low cost to our community. Uh, one of our other peers, these goats were actually involved in the youth program, the green um, youth summer jobs program, actually uh, eating vegetation, getting rid of weeds. So that's a photo of that. And so uh, the Greenway is a, also, it has these six priority sites, but many people involved in, in doing planning. And a lot of, uh, we did a, a hired a, a landscape architectural firm to actually develop a, a plan, a Greenway plan that includes, you know, more um, bike paths and working with the city's transportation department, et cetera, on those type of issues, in addition to those priority parcels that I showed in the previous picture. In terms of sustainability innovations, we also have been involved with, um, you know, prioritizing, uh, you know, having all of our developments as well as other work that we do be done to the highest levels of energy and environmental sustainability as possible. We've had many projects related to this. This is a project where we worked with the Mass Bay Transportation Authority, a local um, civic association that hires youth in the summer to actually put green roofs on the bus stops. So this is a picture of folks putting green roofs, meaning sedum that grows and prevents water from kind of just being run off down, to the, down into the sewer. So a lot of that type of work has been done along with our you know, green infrastructure training and certification. 
We've also been investing in groups that are involved in recycling um, food waste, Cero, as well as um, other uh, helping to get energy re um, retrofits and other things done. And of course, the resident voices are key to all the work that we've done. So this is the building that I mentioned in 2011 that we built and broke ground and cut the ribbon on the same day that we broke ground with the governor on the on the construction of the Fairmount stop right across the street. That's the, that's the bridge right there. And just an example of families that uh, live in our units and that, you, that was taken inside of the unit. And more examples of from the other neighborhoods with the other community development corporations of work uh, to you know, mot uh, mobilize residents to kind of uh, address issues in their community from affordable housing to um, increased green space and increased economic opportunity. So, you know, that's what we've been about. And I can definitely spend more time if you like talking about the housing side, but, you know, some of the opportunities that still lie ahead for us is to do more work, especially in the green infrastructure kind of side of the ledger. We discovered from a, a report that the, the American Cities Collaborative and uh, Coalition and the local initiative support corporation did a couple of years back that our neighborhoods the fairmount corridor neighborhoods are akin to kind of um, what we call gateway cities here in massachusetts which are akin to kind of third world countries in terms of the the the, um, the, the demographics of some of those of some pockets of the of the corridor and so how to stimulate jobs is something that's an opportunity particularly on the environmental and energy sustainab uh, sustainability side. And then housing, we continue to try to look for new tools uh, to develop occupied housing in particular. We try to you know, build that housing to uh, highest levels of green and energy sustainability as possible. On the transit side, we are still trying to, uh, we are winning the, the fight to get uh, increased headways on the transit line. We have recently been able to get the Charlie card reader uh, and free transfers is another thing. And then just continuing to do climate justice work um, that we are now in very much engaged in and trying to, um, you know, uh, win in our community. So those are some opportunities as well as challenges related to each of the kind of buckets of work that the Fairmount CDC collaborative has. And so that's my presentation. And this, these are just some of the questions that I always like to put to myself as well as others, but happy to try to answer any questions that people have and um, you know, talk more about some of the housing development work that we are doing yeah, since this is a housing group as appropriate. So Gail, I know we have one question in the chat um, from Teresa Berg that says, do you see that COVID has resulted in greater remote working opportunities within the Fairmount community? And is that influencing the future of TOD? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been, you know, we haven't done any formal surveys. Or I don't have any formal um, analyses of that. But in anecdotally, it's been a mixed bag. Um, there have a lot of the people who work and live and work in our community are, are in the service sector. And as I'm sure folks during the height of COVID and even now found out, the service sector jobs, meaning people who work uh, in hospitals as administra administrative work in hospitals or work in um, grocery stores, you know, doing stock in the shelves or, you know, bank tellers, you know, if you want to go to kind of a mid or more higher income, but not, but still very moderate income level, they're all, they were all considered essential employees, you know, during the height of COVID. So I think there were definitely some people who were able, there was, it was without question to uh, go remote during COVID. Um, and yes, there was a dip. I don't have the stats, but I know for a fact there was a dip in the number of um, uh, trips uh, on the Fairmount line uh, during COVID that we're now starting to see a steady rise back up as people have started to go back to work over the last six months or so. Um, even on a hybrid basis. I say that I can't, I don't have exact stats, but my sense of things based on our resident population, because Codman has about a thousand units of rental housing in our portfolio. Um, and we have done some surveying of our residents during the height of COVID. Um, uh, we took a sampling of about 10%. 
I know from that sample, as well as from my general knowledge of our of the thousand uh, units, the households that live in our units, that I'd say about 50% of them were very, were very much um, out and about and having and did not have the opportunity to to stay home during COVID if uh, they had to go to work. And the other 50% of them, I think, did have some ability to do that. So I think that that might influence TOD, um, but I, I'm not sure. I think that as, as, as we are now starting to get back to work in terms of physically, physically back to work, that uh, tra the transit-oriented development will still be important, um, you know, for, for the neighborhoods like ours, because, you know, they, they're the ones, low and moderate income people, uh, people are the ones that support our transit system for the most part. Um, and they are still very much uh, tied to service oriented jobs that don't necessarily have a lot of opportunity to do remote work. So I think it definitely, I'm sure will have some implications broadly speaking, because there are in the broader context, there are you know, many more people who can stay home and, but um, I, I have, I, so I have a feeling though that transit or development is something that, that is here to stay. Thank you, Gail. Um, and I know you touched on some challenges and opportunities. We have another question from Lorraine. Were there strategies that you found particularly helpful in getting the community involved? Hmm, strategies that were particularly helpful. Well, I think what was helpful for us, and, and it wasn't always easy because people who live in our neighborhood, they got many pressures on them. So, you know, their pressures are, you know, how, do I have a you know, good child care, affordable child care for my child because I have to go to my $15 an hour job? Can I afford child care? Do I, can I get a child care voucher? Do I have enough money to pay the rent, et cetera? So engaging folks in things when they're just focused on, you know, meeting their basic needs is not necessarily easy. But one of the things that we did find that, you know, was, did resonate was, you know, just starting the process, we have what we call Fairmount Fellows. And that was folks that we actually, to, in, some, in some cases, stipended to actually do some analysis of the, in the early days of the, of the Fairmount line piece. And that was, um, you know, going out there and actually counting, getting educated about why transit was necessary, transit or development. Trans, increased transit was necessary, getting education about how um, transit can help impact air quality in our neighborhoods, because our neighborhoods have some major thoroughfares going through them that go straight from our neighborhoods to downtown. And so many people were using those thoroughfares to come through our neighborhood who didn't even live in Boston. They are the suburbanites that were coming through to get downtown. And so, you know, our neighborhood also had the highest level of asthma of, of was one of the highest level of any, any neighborhood in the state. And so that resonated with folks in terms of, okay, so transit and asthma and reduction of vehicle use and an increase in um, transit use could help impact uh, my, the health of my family. So we pay folks in some instances, stipended people to go and actually count the number of cars coming through the neighborhood and starting to kind of bring that data and that information to the um, elected officials and other policymakers who had control of some of the purse strings and the policies to help, help loosen up some of that $200 million as the neighborhood presented their analysis of how many cars were coming through the, their neighborhood and calibrated that to asthma issues and other health issues in the, in the community. And we actually have the, some of the worst air quality in our neighborhood and that's, that's evidenced by some of the heat mapping and other things that have been done by um, the, ac the academic institutions and other parties. And then residents were also have also been involved in the advocacy around uh, the campaigns to kind of prevent gentrification and displacement in our community. So definitely right now, as a matter of fact, residents in our organizing staff are very active in um, with doing a um, petition drive with residents where the staff and the residents are going out on the weekends uh, to collect uh, petitions around a new, what, what we call millionaire's fair share, basically fair share amendment, which is a millionaire's tax in our community. And using the, if it passes, using those additional resources to um, seed affordable housing development. So not easy, but those are the ways that we found 
by connecting it to people. I always say we need to connect to people's health and pocketbooks. Like, how does it impact their health? How does it impact their their well their financial well being? You know, coming at it from the perspective, particularly things like because we're now very active in the climate change and environmental stewardship space as a collaborative as well as a CDC alone. But coming at it from the perspective of we want to do the right thing for our planet, which of course is the right thing. I'm not, yeah, we need to do that. But when you're just trying to make sure, like I said, that you have, you know, to pay the rent, climate change is not your biggest issue. But if you start translating that into, did you know that if you could get an energy retrofit done in your home, that might save you, here's your pocketbook, 30% on your electric bill or your gas bill or your heat bill. That's when it starts resonating. And, or we have you know, bought you know, some really, um, really uh, knowledgeable doctors that have, you know, we call, they call themselves a climate code blue, a fledgling group of doctors here in some of the local hospitals that have approached us about, we're concerned about what we're seeing and how we're seeing the connection between climate, heat, et cetera, and people's health. So we've, we've had them come in and talk about the intersection with the community of things like even hot days. And again, the studies that were done recently show that we're the hottest of any neighborhood in Boston. And when you look at the map, we have the reddest areas of any um, in terms of heat. Those doctors, I didn't even, I learned a lot. It was uh, one of them is a um, mental health practitioner, a uh, psych psychiatrist. And he talks about how on hot days, his patients are get more agitated because of the heat, don't take their medications as much and therefore end up in the emergency room because they're not medicated and misdiagnosed as a result of some of that. So having those, those type of informational pieces and those kind of, how does it impact your health? How does it impact your pocketbook? That's how we've started to see community people get more involved. And so, yeah. Okay, and it looks like we have well, a the TOD. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, do you want to go ahead and take that one? Yeah, it's, I see Lauren's asking about um, for the TOD housing, what is the ratio for parking to units? You know, um, zoning, from a zoning perspective, the ratio for affordable housing um, it used to be 0.7 per unit, I believe, um, 0.7 parking spaces per unit. Uh, I believe recently within the last eight, nine months, uh, the, the city changed the regulations to, I believe is now 0.5 um, parking spaces per unit. Um, that's, that's what I believe. And what we've been doing with our housing is increasingly starting um, to build in um, bike racks as part of our house, as a part of our housing. Um, we've been putting, you know, sign, working with a group called Walk Boston to put signs in and around our housing on the street polls that talk about the distance from the from our affordable housing development to the Fairmont commuter rail line to parks, et cetera. So people get a sense and encourage people to walk. But yeah, it's it's about that, um, about point point five, I believe it's what it is. Let's see another question. Yeah, so Therese Triessa, Teresa is asking about the, I would love, I would also be interested if the food industry work that you've done is resulting in greater food availability in the community, within the community. Restated is the food being produced and shipped out or is it staying local? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, and there are so many angles to this um, that, that uh, which my peers were here to help me answer because um, that Bornstein, um, Pearl, um, uh, kind of uh, Commonwealth Kitchen concept, which is the incubator that's incubating at least 30 businesses right now, is also food justice oriented because it's mostly small MBE, minority business enterprises that are doing their uh, kind of uh, yoking and, you know, um, kind of nurturing their startups out of there. And, and so they can talk, I, they would have been able to talk more, but from my perspective with our 23,000 square foot urban agriculture site, we are, um, most of that uh, poundage, uh, about 6,000 pounds of produce every year is being distributed in, in the community. So I would say, yes, it is resulting in greater food, uh, healthy, fresh, 
produce being generated and being distributed at low cost or no cost in, in our community. We grow our produce um, with, uh, we can't call ourselves a certified organic farm, but we use an, an, um, a, organic practices. We don't use any pesticides or anything. Um, and that food is sold at um, the farm stand that's on site. It's also sold in our um, Codman Square, which is the main uh, square and uh, on Saturdays uh, during the summer. And during the winter, we have a winter's farmer's market that we do in conjunction with the Dorchester Food Co-op where we sell our produce um, uh, inside um, during the winter. So I'd say, yes, it is definitely impacting um, availability of fresh, healthy produce in our community. We've done some surveying of um, how folks have been using the produce uh, and, and what the impact of that produce that they've accessed from us has had on their family's life. And the surveying that we do, have done indicates that people are eating um, as a result of our, our produce, eating more vegetables, eating um, uh, more healthily. We also use our um, our produce to support, we have three senior buildings, about 63 units of senior housing in three different buildings. We do cooking demonstrations because we have community rooms with, in, with kitchens in those facilities. We use the produce to, um, and in conjunction with the local health center to bring in dietitians and do um, cooking demonstrations uh, in those senior buildings. And, and we give some of the food away when necessary to people who can't afford it. We also have developed, um, are using the food that we grow um, as part of um, Dorchester Food Co-ops uh, has launched a uh, community shared agriculture program. Um, they're working with a number of, of farms, both urban farms, as well as suburban and rural farms that bring their produce in weekly. Um, but we have started, um, you know, uh, having shares now, uh, community uh, sh uh, shared agriculture shares, where folks now for, I think it's like $20 a week, you get a certain amount of poundage that is guaranteed from us. So we're also starting the process of moving into, um, you know, we're taking SNAP. Uh, I think you all may know what SNAP is, you know, you know, accessing, you know, the WIC, the type benefits uh, for our produce. So yeah, I'd say that it's definitely having implications. Is it being shipped outside of our community? Not at this point. I do, I do have a dream of, you know, kind of like the homeboy industries concept. I don't know if folks know about that, but that's not about food, but it's, you know, out in LA uh, have developed, I think a recording industry that, that was launched locally. Well, and now kind of going national, it's gone national and I think even international. That's my goal for our urban agriculture site. My goal is, I mean, you know, from an equity perspective, I say, I'd love to see, and most of, and most of the produce is cultivated by men of color who are reentry citizens. So we try to train men of color to, on the site, use the site to train men of color to, um, to learn uh, agriculture skills. And so I, I mean, talk about justice, I, uh, you know, equity. I'd love to see those men take our produce, bottle it and sell it on Newberry Street for much more money to people who can afford to. Newberry Street is one of the kind of the Rodeo Drive Street of Boston. You know, that would be economic justice to be able to take our produce, bottle it in some kind of fancy container and sell it at one of these boutique shops on Newberry Street for like, $50 a pop or something and have that money come back into the neighborhood. So yeah, I mean, we haven't yet started that, that process of, of having it go outside. However, we have, um, there's one um, kind of, I call it a nonprofit, nonprofit grocer. I don't, I, it may be nonprofit. It was Doug Rausch who used to, I think he was with Trader Joe's, one of the principals of Trader Joe's. He came into our community about 10 years ago and with, in a very collaborative way, started, um, uh, what they call uh, the daily table, where he basically is taking foods that are gleaned foods, but still good, healthy foods, and selling them at like really affordable prices in the neighborhood in a small grocery store that's part of the health center uh, here in the neighborhood. And so we sell our produce at low cost also to the daily table, which is that kind of nonprofit um, grocer. So there's some of that going on, but we haven't gone outside the neighborhood. I see another question from Lorraine about 
what, what are some of the challenges of collaboration amongst the CDCs? Good question. I mean, we've been at it now for approaching 20 years as a Fairmount CDC collaborative. I'd have to say that um, we've had a really, really good relationship over the last 20 years. There are two of us as executive directors who have been in the collaborative pretty much since its beginning. Um, uh, one of them left, just like I did, took a short leave of absence um, for me for about a year, but came right back at it. I went, um, and the other one ran a, one of the largest CDCs, Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corp, uh, for about 20 years, left for about two years, and now came back to run the other um, CDC, which is the other third partner CDC, which is a smaller community development corporation. So I'd say that it's been a great run. Uh, we have not had too many issues with collaboration and I'm sure I tend to forget the painful things, but I'm sure we have. But um, the things that right now strike me about the challenges of the collaboration, it's been a really good situation. We were able, as I said, in that benefit slide of what the benefit of this collaboration has been to the community development corporations. We've been able to build our brand. We've been able to build our political clout because we banded together as a collective, because we not only the three CDCs came together, but also these spinoff organizations that are now part of us, you know, that we, the Fairmount um, um, Transit Coalition, which is a very, has probably about eight or 10 different um, kind of grassroots groups involved looking at the transit side. Um, the Greenway, there's a Fairmount Greenway Task Force, which has another eight, 10, 12, um, folks that are more concerned um, with greening issues, all that's kind of under our umbrella. And so that has been um, great to have all that collaboration. But I'd say that right now, one of the, so we've raised a lot of money historically, especially in the early days. So that was a good thing. And we made certain agreements about how we would split that money as a three CDCs with some of the, sometimes more dispor disproportionately giving more money to the smaller Community Development Corporation, which is Southwest Boston CDC, while the larger CDCs took less. So there were lots of benefits, but I'd say if there was a challenge right now, as we've kind of moved into, we started off with those three things, which was transit-oriented development, transit equity, greenway development. We've moved over the last 10 years or so into that more of the economic, financial, and you know, small business type work. And now over the last two years into the climate justice and environmental justice work as a collaborative. Well, one of the challenges as we moved into the climate justice work and we got a grant from the Kresge Foundation, a pretty sizable grant as a, uh, for the collaborative to do planning first and starting in 2019 with the community and then to do community mobilization around changing climate policy, working with community and organizing the community to impact climate and environmental policy in our state. They, and that's been working well. We've been able to win two out of three climate um, pieces of climate legislation as we've mobilized our, our constituents over the last year and a half in particular. And that's leading to more resources for the CDCs. I mean, I just got about $150,000 in a grant that was coming out of some of the resources, the financial resources that were aligned with one of the climate justice um, bills that we were able to fight for and win. But one of the challenges of that has been, even as we bring, as we start moving into new spaces, I mean, we all were doing, some of us were doing this individually as CDCs anyway, climate justice, climate, environmental justice work, affordable housing work, uh, economic development work. But some of the CDCs were more um, steeped in doing certain things than others. And so one of the challenges has been as we start bringing resources in for just, for example, on the climate and environmental justice work, Codman has been doing that work already. Some of the other CDCs, not so much. So the challenge has been how does the organ, how do the organizations show up for and stay accountable to the collective agenda and the collective work, body of work that we're trying to accomplish. That has definitely been the source of some friction sometimes even as we develop, even as we um, raise significant resources, because we now have a, about a $600,000 grant from Kresge, I think it's $600,000 over three years to implement the climate justice work that we planned during 2019, 2020. And yet some of those CDCs, we all agreed when we wrote the proposal and we did this work that we would be mobilizing our base, we would be all accountable to the, you know, um, 
activating the legislative agenda, et cetera. And some of the CDC just don't have the ability to do that, at least one of them. And so that, that can be sometimes a challenge. It's like when, we're, when we say we're gonna do something together, do we all have the capacity to do it together? And there have been some, some strengths that uh, other strengths that people have bought to substitute for some of the core strengths, but it definitely has been sometimes a challenge with that. And so let's see. And Miranda, you put a question, submitted a question on the housing side. I'm curious to know more about your financing structures. Do you rely on a combination of LIHTC, grants, equity, and mortgages? Yes, 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 on the housing side. Uh, our deals are probably similar, similar to many of your deals as an affordable housing developer. And by the way, affordable housing is a core business of Cotton Square Neighborhood Development Corp. We have launched uh, into many other areas, but it is still our core work and our core business. And so most of our deals are have 9% um, credits in them, uh, occasionally 4% credit deals. We're doing those as well. And the whole alphabet soup of grants and equity sources that I'm sure everybody else has in their um, deals. So we're involved with, um, we're a NeighborWorks America affiliate. I'm not sure if you're, anyone is familiar with NeighborWorks America, but they're a national um, congressionally chartered national community development intermediary that provide support and funding um, to their affiliates. And so we do get some of the, that money there. We get money, we work, we are always looking for new sources of money. We have pre-development funds from sources like LISC. We're now working with the Low Income Investment Fund for the first time on a, on a pre-development, I think it's pre-development or acquisition loan. So many of those alphabet soups, you know, that, you know, home funding, all of that is typically part of uh, the deals, but low income housing tax credit is mainly what we're using to forward our um, rental development work. We, uh, we do do quite a bit of home ownership work as well, though we've developed probably about 100 units of, of affordable housing in our 41 year history and have sold those affordable homes rather, have sold those to first time home buyers. And those come with different streams of funding as well. So I didn't know if you wanted more detail, but yes, we are, um, Miranda, using that. Okay, um, so it looks like that is all the questions I see. I don't know if anyone else has any other questions for Gail while we have mm -hmm. her here. Mm -hmm. um, or if you have any other things you'd like to say to the group, Gail? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I know that um, this is more of a housing group and I've been very kind of comprehensive and not as not 100% leads a focus on the housing side, um, but happy to if there's anyone that wants to know more about our housing work um, to, you know, talk either uh, as an aside, if, you know, you can, you know, get my contact information from uh, Miranda and I'll put my email address also in the chat. Um, happy to you know, go deeper into the housing work and how we do the housing uh, work that we do. Uh, but no, I'm just, I, I'm really, like I said, I'm sorry that we don't have a chance to kind of have a real interaction with each other because it's a small group. And I think it would be great for me to be learning from all of you um, because I'm sure that there's a lot that we could learn from each other. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk and thank you, Lorraine. and. Um, Miranda and Philip for um, inviting me to come in and speak. Um, we're, we're really, you know, there's always a lot going on in Boston. So if you're ever around in Boston or wanna know more about our TOD work or any other aspect, I'd be happy to, to talk. So thanks again for the invitation. Great, and thank you for being here. Um, like Gail mentioned, I will be sending out an email, a follow-up email with the recording of this video. Um, it will have Gail's contact information in case you didn't grab it here. I'm also going to throw into the chat um, a link to our Housing Colorado event calendar. We have quite a few events coming up in May, including our end of legislative session wrap-up webinar, um, which I believe is next week. And then we'll have a spring site tour at the St. Francis Apartments at Cathedral Square, which is quite a mouthful. Um, and then we also have just put on the books our statewide outreach and engagement, um, which will be happening throughout the summer. So keep an eye on all of those things. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And I wanna just say thank you again for being here and thank you again to Gail and we hope to see you soon. Yes, thanks. Take care everyone.
Bye. Bye.